So I work at the Vando Research Institute, and this building is the research institute. We local we localized that at the Grand Rapids, Michigan. That's where the red dots is. Okay, and uh, uh, <coughs> so I update my slides a little bit, but uh, all the content is in your handout. The updating just too easier to explanation for the concept, and uh, I will. Uh, explain here the reason why we use this approach, why I think this is a good approach, and also I will show you what have we have done with this uh, approach, the project. So we know, we all know now that there's a large group of disease which has different clinical manifestations or different pathologies. They all call the prion disease. The reason is that uh, they all involve the, this protein called a PRP. And uh, this is a protein attached to the cell membranes through this anchor, which we call the GPI anchor, okay? This is a highly conserved protein, and uh, it's abundantly expressed in everybody's brain. And uh, luckily, in most of us, the, the protein is in a normal form, which we call the PRPC. And uh, during the disease, some of the molecules change the shape and the, what we call is the PRP, scraby. And because it's changed the shape, it gains the new properties. And uh, you heard about they like to clump together. They form what we call aggregates. They develop this resistance to protease digestions. And an uh, important property they acquire is these clumps. They actually can recruit the normal proteins to the clump and force them to change the shape. And that's what we call the seeded conversion of prion infectivity. And uh, we call the, all these aggregates called the prions. Then the question is, uh, you have all these different diseases. Are the prions in every different disease is the same? And uh, in majority of the disease, the overall shape of the prion is similar. But you can see that I kind of draw these uh, little differences between each of them. And these little differences, and uh, they can maintain these little differences. They can recruit the PRP to form the same shape of them. And it's believed that the little differences that cause the difference in clinical manifestations or the pathologies. And that's what we call the prion strings. That's just like uh, the flus. Uh, every year you have uh, different vaccines because every year you have different strains of influenza virus. Okay, so we, what do we call the prion strains? So what happens uh, in the cell, the, the PRP, the normal PRP is localized on the outside of the cell. It attaches the cell membrane through these GPI anchors. During the disease, you do have these PRP B molecules, which is also on the cell membrane, and they can recruit the normal PRP to the clump, and then they convert it to the abnormal shape. And this interaction and possibly the conformational change during the process can induce the changes within the cell. That leads to the neurotoxicity. Okay. If we talk about the developing therapies, what do we want to do is we want to find a good target. So here we have three good targets here. And the one, one is obviously the PRP scraby, right? This is disease to form. If we can remove them, that will be great. And the second is the PRPC. You just heard about it. If we can limit it or to prevent it, sorry, to prevent it to interact with the abnormal form, and then we can prevent the disease. And uh, the third one is the change within the cell. If we can stop the cellular process, we can stop the neurotoxicities. So a lot of work has been done on, uh, on all three targets previously, and uh, the mainly the use, the aging they use, you heard about the small molecules from Roboto, and I also use the antibodies against a variety form of PRPs. So I briefly reviewed that. So first of all, for the PRP scrapey, again, this is a disease specific, it's a great target. 
And uh, a lot of work has been done, and uh, this is uh, probably one of the uh, most thorough work done in Stan Prusner's lab. And uh, over the years, they developed molecules. And uh, one of the leading compounds they develop is IND24. And uh, it effectively uh, extends the life in mouse. It, it works against the mouse prion very well. But uh, it does not work against the human prion. Uh, why is that? One of the possible reasons is that we have these different prion strains. You can develop spawn molecules. It probably work very well. It fit right in to prevent these prions. However, it doesn't fit to other prions. So it can work with, against the mouse prion, but it does not work for human prion or different prion strains. And uh, so this approach, you have a potential problem of the variability of the prions, different prion strains, and all, well, sorry. And also, it is actually extremely difficult to develop a specific agent against the PRP scrapey. A lot of people are trying, we are trying as well. And uh, so another thing you can uh, target, you can, uh, work against is the cellular process. You can stop the cellular process, you can stop the neurotoxicity. One of the best work in the field is probably from Giovanni Malucci's lab. She used a compound that which, which is developed by GSK. It stopped the process called unfolding protein response, or ER stress. And uh, when they, when they use this compound to the mouse, they can actually prevent the clinical disease in the mouse. But the problem is that it has a severe side effect. And why is that? Because these cellular process is not specifically only used for the disease, the neurons. And these process are also used for other cells in other tissues. In this particular case, the unfolded protein response also used for pancreatic cells to produce insulin. So if you block that, you can have a very severe side effect. So that's the potential pitfall of that. And the third target is against the PRPC. And the, the best work <coughs> so far has been shown that the, besides the ASO, which is very promising, uh, you're gonna hear that very soon, but uh, this has been done with the, an the antibodies from John Collins' lab. What we, they did is they gave the antibody and it can if effectively prevent the development of prion disease if you give the prion uh, through the peripheral route. If you directly inject the prion into the brain, it doesn't work. That is because the antibody cannot cross blood-brain barrier. So that is uh, one of the potential pitfalls, the, the blood-brain barrier. And also, some of the antibodies uh, bind the PRP may lead to neurotoxicities. Uh, so for us, we think that is so far, the PRPC seem to be a good target for treat this disease. And the antibodies seem to be working quite well. And the problem is the blood-brain barrier. How can we overcome that? And uh, we turn to these lovely animals. Why, <laughs> why we love that? Because uh, shark and the camels, they produce a specific type of antibodies. I don't know that much about shark, but uh, in Michigan, we do have alpaca. So, <laughs> and, uh, so what kind of antibody? We know that the, this is the shape of antibody in uh, everybody's brain, in, uh, not the brain, everybody's body. And, uh, so it has two chains. One is called the heavy chain. One is the light chain. And these are encoded by two different genes. And the, the, it binds the target through this region. So it needs the two proteins made and come together, properly assembled, so they can bind to the target. But for these animals, in camel, uh, the alpaca, they also produce this antibody. It's called a single chain antibody. It only encoded by the single gene. And uh, it binds to the target through these little bits of the protein. And you can actually just use these little bits of protein, express them. It's very small. That's why it's called a nanobody. And because it's a single gene, you can actually express them. 
you can put it in the vector and directly express them in the brain by using a gene therapy approach. So the, the, the vector for gene therapy approach is we use the adeno-associated virus, and you can read that there is, a, there is a lot of good things, advantages for using that. But I just want to point out two things. So one, some of the adeno vectors has been already approved by FDA to treat other human diseases. And another good thing is that the scientists that are actively developed, adenovirus cannot cross blood-brain barrier, but scientists that have developed these recombinant adenovirus, at least in mouse, you can just inject the IV, they will go to the brain and express the brain very efficiently. So we use this version of adenovirus and try to express and to see that whether they can express nanobody in the brain. So Oh, first, uh, what kind of nanobody we're using? We are using our collaborate. So we are screening nanobody ourselves, but uh, for this study, we use our collaborator. They produce the 35 nanobodies against the PRPC. So we take it, we do uh, this binding assay. We first test whether they bind the recombinant protein, the PRP. These are expressed in the bacteria. And all these 35 nanobodies bind very well. But the recombinant protein, there is a potential problem, is that the bacteria express recombinant protein. They don't have sugar modifications, and they don't have these GPI anchors. So the green are the sugars, modify the PRP proteins. So we, take the, we took two best binders to test whether they bind these modified PRP. Yes, indeed, they bind quite well. So it binds the PRPC well, does it prevent the conversion to PRP scrapey? And uh, this is uh, done with my co our collaborators. Uh, you heard about the, in these scrapey infected cells, they have these PK resistant bands, which is not in the uninfected cells. But uh, in the scrapey infected cells, if you add nanobody with increased dosage, these PK resistant bands disappear that indicates that they can prevent the conversion. They also did the, the in vitro amyloid fiber growth, so they can prevent the amyloid fiber growth. You know, for us, we use the PMCA, we can use recombinant the PRP and use the PMCA, Roboto just mentioned. And uh, so this is, one lane is the first round, then you propagate it to second round, the third round, fourth round, and the sixth round. They can keep propagating these uh, PK resistant band. In the absence of nanobody, if you add a nanobody with increased dosage, you can see the propagation actually inhibited. If you take the end product, that is the last product of this PMCA, put on the cells and see the infectivity. If you look at this without a treatment, they have very high infectivity. If you have a high nanobody treatment, the infectivity is all gone. So they can actually efficiently prevent the prion conversion in vitro. And then we try to express them in vivo. As a control, we use these green fluorescent protein produced by jellyfish to deliver, to see that because we inject the IV into the mouse and to see they get to the brain. And indeed, they, this is a control, and this is 21 days after injection, you see that the all the green fluorescence in the brain. And uh, this is just uh, to show that they express almost every neuron, at least the majority of the neurons express them. But this is only GFP, does the nanobody express? So we have to use the Western blot. This, one minute, it's almost done. Uh, this is GFP, and this is the, one of the nanobody actually expressed quite well. So we want to test this to we're going to run in the in vivo prion disease test and see if it works against the prion infection, at least in mouse. So this is a summary, and especially I want to thank these grants. And the one is the Katie Paul Duprec Memorial Grants, and the Cheryl Malloy Memorial Grants, Jeffrey Smith Memorial Grants, Tom Stevenson Memorial Grants and the CJD Foundation Grants to support this research. And uh, 
These are the, uh, our collaborators, and these are previous member of the lab and the current member who are carrying out this work. Thank you very much.